हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते सवादिखा सलाम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू हु हैव जॉइन फ्रॉम डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वेलकम टू दिस वर्कशॉप एट द एशिया पैसिफिक पीपल्स फोरम 2021 व्हिच इज बीइंग हेल्ड ऑनलाइन दिस ईयर ऑन अ वर्चुअल प्लेटफॉर्म ड्यू टू द कोविड-19 पेंडेमिक एज वी ऑल नो This pandemic which has once again brought to the fore the tightening grip of market forces on our well-being. The workshop on power of the 99% to stop corporate capture is co-hosted by Alcyon Burma ESCR Net and CNS under the theme of harnessing the power of people's movements for a fairer just and equitable asia pacific the workshop is also being streamed live on the drtspr tv channel of telangana india and also on the facebook page of cns through this workshop we aim to elaborate on the different manifestations of corporate capture and experiences of people's movements in asia pacific to combat it in order to advance development justice The workshop will also focus on the link between corporate capture, religious fundamentalism, militarization and patriarchy. Without any further ado, I hand over the mic to the moderator and facilitator of this workshop, our dear dear firebrand friend Debbie Stoddard, founder of ASEAN Burma, that is Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma, that supports national and grassroots movements. that are working for human rights and democracy since 1981 debi has worked as a crime reporter government advisor human rights advocate and educator in 1996 she founded alcyon burma to develop innovative human rights training and advocacy programs she is a member of escr net corporate accountability working group sc and the innovation for change global governance circle her focus is on women's leadership atrocity prevention and corporate accountability over to you debi thank you so much shobha and so great to be uh, working together again today it's a uh, it's a uh, my lucky week um welcome everybody to uh, our workshop on the power of the 99% uh, to stop corporate capture and in order to in order to um in order to uh uh um get an idea of what we mean by corporate capture i'm pleased to introduce mona sabella co uh, the coordinator of the corporate accountability working group of escr net and um so that she can also explain to us this really amazing video that we are about to watch over to you mona thank you so much debi can everybody hear me okay yes we can yes great great um yeah it's great to be here with everybody and uh um yeah it's a pleasure for me to to talk about the work that um ESCR net members have has been doing um over the last few years and perhaps i wanted to start with the animation video that many members of the corporate accountability working group have worked on along with the project advisory group on corporate capture um we have a lot of names for our groups but it just means that there's a lot of different people from different parts of the world who are involved in in different pieces of work that we are we are doing uh on corporate capture um and so essentially this first video is um an animation video that was created to try and um illustrate uh in a way that is um you know short and uh creative what corporate capture means um and 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 you know what is this concept um and what are some of the manifestations of it so 
instead of me speaking too much about it, I'm going to show you the, the video um, in English. I hope that's okay. But it is available as well in Hindi, in Spanish, in Arabic, in French, um, in Portuguese. Um, and we are open to uh, trying to translate it into as many languages as we possibly can with the hope of having movements and uh, different members of the network and allies of the network to use it in their um, political education as, as, a, as a way to popularize uh, corporate capture. So I'm gonna share my screen now. <clears throat> And I will share my sound as well. Okay, this should work. The coal mining company promised us jobs, development, and a booming economy. Some of us did get jobs, but life became harder with little control over our daily schedule. And soon, our baby got sick, with no signs of getting better. And we weren't the only ones who were getting sick. I had to get to the bottom of this. What I found was a complicated story involving elected representatives and business people working together and changing any law that got in their way. This problem is bigger than me. I knew I had to join with other voices to be heard. They heard me and tried to silence me. And it felt hopeless. The doctors, politicians, the police all believed that the company was only trying to help. Thanks to a network of human rights defenders, I got my freedom back, and my voice is even louder now, because this problem is bigger than our community. It's not just about one coal mining company taking over our community, our health, and our lives. It's how they do it. And how did the people who are supposed to represent us begin speaking for the company and convincing us to trust the company too? It's a complicated story, but one thing is clear. Company profits are being considered more valuable than our lives. So how do we fight for people over profits? The human rights community has started to use the words corporate capture to refer to this trend of corporations taking over our hard-won democratic institutions. Corporate capture happens when companies manipulate our local governments for their own private profit. It happens when politicians favor the corporate donors who fund their campaigns over the people they're elected to represent. It happens when elected officials go on to work for the corporations they used to regulate, and when corporate employees get appointed to public positions. Because corporations understand the power that we have as a community, they invest their resources to convince us that they are socially responsible corporations. Much like with what happened to us here, that mining company opened up a community hospital and donated medicine to distract us from knowing that they're contributing to the cause of our illness. All of this is corporate capture. Together, we must start exposing corporate capture and demand that our governments do their jobs and protect our rights. Do you think you've seen corporate capture happening in your community? Share your story by answering this short survey at escr-net.org forward slash cc. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, that very thought provoking and engaging animation, Mona. Did you want to say anything about why um, ESCRNet started this project? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I think part of the reason why I think the our work 
on on corporate capture as a, a project started is because we saw how corporations have been um, capturing government decision making and taking over government decision making in a very similar way across the world. So whether we were in Indi working in India or in Mexico uh, or in Palestine, the concept of corporate capture remained the same, where, whereby a lot of our government decision making, we were seeing it becoming uh, largely influenced by corporations. And therefore, um, you know, therefore, you know, the dis the, the decision making was uh, more uh, was weaker, was less representative of our rights and our public good, essentially. So I think the the attempt to work collectively on corporate capture is really to put a name on on what is on what the problem is. I think a lot of people already know um, the realities and already know how corporations um, are impacting their lives wherever they may be. But I think um, you know, putting a name on it helps us really identify the problem and helps us, um, you know, helps us as well, like try to organize together to push against it and to overcome it. And this is why um, in a very recent launch that we did of a comic series on corporate capture, the title of the comic is The Power of the 99% to Overcome Corporate Capture. Um, and, and, and that, you know, I think is, is very, um, is very, uh, is looking at it in a very, um, you know, uh, let's say optimistic way, but cautiously optimistic way, because we know that there is a lot for us to do as communities. Um, there's a lot of organizing that we have to do. Uh, but I think, you know, after, um, after our initial uh, stage of popularizing the concept of corporate capture and better uh, naming the problem publicly and, and uh, working on understanding it better than I think uh, it will be easier for us as well to identify different ways that we can organize to, to, to address it. And there are already efforts that, are, that exist that are organizing to, to resist corporate capture that I think we'll hear more about uh, today. But I think what I will do as well, uh, I'm not sure if we have time for it, but I want to share the, the, the um, website for at least the comic series in our chat box. Yes, um, please share it. Please share yeah. it, Mona. It's, uh, I assure everybody it's worthwhile to check out uh, the, the comic, which is just as compelling and engaging as the animation we just saw. Thank you so much, Mona. And we'll come back Great. to you Thank about you. what we can do next. So now we have a name to this phenomena about why, why we've been facing these blocks, even though we're supposed to have democratic and transparent structures. So um, I wanted to go into um, the next 15 minutes. So it's five minutes per speaker, I'm so sorry. Um, but we wanted to actually have a little bit of a more examples of how corporate capture is manifested manifested. And um, I was going to call on Bobby Ramaka, who actually is the main engine between behind this whole workshop, who initiated this idea and, um, and pulled um, all of us together. Bobby from CNS, Asha Pariva and the Socialist Party of India. Bobby, did you want to spend the next five minutes just giving us some more examples of what corporate capture looks like? Yes, thanks a uh, lot, Debbie. And uh, I will spend rather uh, very quickly just go through some of the manifestations. Uh, and then let us hear the voices, as you said, which uh, of people who are leading struggles against corporate abuse and uh, share the, how it has been manifesting for them. 
So a lot of you who are in this call and some of you who are not in this call, they, uh, you know, movements and people's struggles across the world, they have, uh, they, uh, they deliberated together with uh, a part of ESCR net led process to, uh, to, undeep, to deeply, to share, have a common shared understanding of corporate capture, as Mona just said, as well as uh, uh, develop a framework on how to identify corporate capture. So there were certain manifestations which we found in different struggles. And I would really encourage all of you to please see the comic series with the link of which will Mona would have shared already in the chat box. If not, very soon you will get to see. And you will find and a lot of you who are, uh, you know, working in different uh, aspects of uh, development justice, you will find how corporate abuse manifests in your own struggles and movements and experiences. And we will look forward to hearing from you. One of the very common one of uh, manifestation which we found was community manipulation and uh, you, you and uh, which uh, refers to the um, you know the way the corporate undermines uh, community decision making processes related to investment projects or other projects the strategies employed involve the use of financial or other incentives to entice community leaders uh, financial incentives alcohol etc uh, to support uh, you know they entice community leaders to support corporate projects that undermine the interest and decision of the wider community you the um, another uh, one was economic diplomacy and uh, especially in, uh, the, so in different countries, you, will, you would have found that uh, how um, it, uh, you know uh, corporate capture manifests itself in form of economic diplomacy, and um, this uh, clearly refers to where you know when diplomatic missions are advancing the interest of corporations from their countries operating in foreign countries in cases where these actions are at the expense of the human right of local people, and. Uh, 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 you know, like uh, it, 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 like for example, Bhopal gas tragedy, and there are so many other examples which you'll find from recent past. Also, judicial interference, another uh, manifestation which we found um, how corporations exert over the proceedings and rulings of courts, which provide favorable outcomes for corporations and undermine due process and efforts at seeking access to remedy and accountability legislative and policy interference of uh, the, the you know the pressure exerted on legislatures and policy makers by corporations and their representatives to provide greater opportunities for business or remove or undermine regulation of corporate activities which ultimately undermine the protection of human rights or another one is privatizing public security services and even in india we are we are, we are seeing uh, you know uh, first towards this that when when the when the use of public security services involves the provision of a salary or other inducement by corporations for police army or other public security services to act in their interest um, against local communities revolving door uh, for i think this is a very common one and you will you should you know when we know about it and we see it around the we, we, try, we see it even more, we recognize it even more. It's a movement of employees from corporate sector to public regulators and other agencies and vice versa. In the process undermining the impartiality of state agencies, facilitating corporate friendly regulation and policy, lessening the application of existing regulations and secu securing favorable corporate contracts with state agencies sharing uh, shaping narratives uh, no, no no i don't need to emphasize on this that you know, in different countries probably this is another very common manifestation the influence of the public opinion by manipulating the media and spreading dominant narratives about progress and development is another manifestation uh, capture of academic institutions is another one uh, which involves uh, you know corporations financing academic institutions affording them opportunities to influence educational priorities including research priorities if you look at the covid response uh, experience um, you know so uh, so these are some of the manifestations and we will hear more from you uh, as the session um, and workshop proceeds ahead oh back to you debbie thanks Thank you so much, Bobby. So succinct and to the point. We are almost pay, uh, uh, moving forward at almost a rapid pace, which is great, um, given that this is uh, going to be a very intense session. Um, I wanted to now move on to um, a presentation by Dr. Sandeep Pandey, the uh, uh, awardee of the Ramon Magsaysay Award, which is essentially our Asian Nobel. 
and uh, a member of Asha Pariva and the Socialist Party of India. Sunday Pandey, Dr. Pandey is actually um, pre-recorded a video message on the India farmer struggle, a very compelling struggle, because he's at the moment on a train racing to another protest and another crisis. So um, please play the video from Dr. Pandey. I'm here to talk about uh, the uh, uh, farmers movement going on in India and how uh, the corporate has been influencing the government policy making. If one thing which has become clear from this movement to the people of India is that uh, our Prime Minister uh, personally and the government in general uh, is under uh, some kind of duress uh, because of the uh, private corporates, uh, mainly uh, two of them, uh, both of them are from Gujarat, the home state of Narendra Modi, uh, Ambani and Adani. And uh, this we can say for two reasons. Uh, first is uh, that uh, the prime minister went to inaugurate uh, the private hospital, which has been started by Mr. Mukesh Ambani. And uh, if you see the picture of that day, uh, you, you realize who's patronizing whom. I mean, uh, the hand of Mukesh Ambani is on Mr. Naren Modi's back, uh, not, not vice versa, as, as you would expect. And, uh, and uh, Adani was just a state level um, entrepreneur uh, before uh, Mr. Modi became the prime minister. But now he is the second most uh, important uh, businessman in the country uh, after Mukesh Ambani, and he uh, gets most of the contracts uh, which the government gives out in India and including abroad. Uh, the most recent is uh, six airports in the country have been given to Adani uh, to manage. The airports themselves were built by the government, but they have been handed over to Adani. Uh, to manage the, uh, uh, their, their affairs. So uh, these things are becoming very apparent. The Prime Minister has appeared in an advertisement for Geo Mobile Phone, which has been started by Mr. Mukesh Ambani's company. Uh, the strategy that this company adopted was it allowed free calls for first six months, and it could do so because it was using the towers of the government uh, telecommunication company called the BSNL. Uh, so using the towers of the government company, this private company was allowed to do its operations and, uh, and it was able to entice people because of its uh, free plan for six months. But now uh, in the competition, uh, BSNL is, is uh, losing out and, and so are other private uh, operators and uh, Geo Mobile is now, uh, has now captured the Indian market. Um, so uh, Mm, this is one thing which has become clear to the farmers that the government is is uh, making all the policies for the interest of uh, of businessmen. If you look at the three laws, all three of them favor the private corporates and are against the interest of the farmers. Um, the government has also uh, been able to influence the media. Uh, some of it has been bought by by Mr. Ambani. Uh, uh, in fact, in fact, a lot of them, and and then the government because it gives advertisements to uh, the media houses, uh, which is a which is a major source of their income, uh, has almost stifled the voice of dissent. And as an example, <coughs> uh, the everybody knows how the farmers movement is being painted as, you know, a, a movement of miscreants. Uh, they have even been called called uh, terrorists and, and Khalistanis, which is uh, a secessionist uh, movement in India. Uh, but uh, uh, we also see that uh, uh, there are other movements which which uh, do not get even a line of coverage in, in, in spite of them, you know, being very important. Uh, the, the one movement which I can uh, mention is, uh, you know, Hindu saints. Uh, sitting on fast to save river Ganga. Uh, four of them have already died. Three of them died while fasting. 
the fourth one was murdered by mining mafia and as we talk uh, there is a saint by the name of swami shivanand saraswati sit sitting in matri sadan haridwar uh, to save ganga but the government is not listening to him and neither is media writing about uh, it so there is complete capture of corporate uh, over the government policies over the media so much so that the voice of the movement the voice of the dissent is not reflected this is the sorry state of affairs of of uh, uh, india we thank uh, dr pandey for taking the trouble to pre record that for our workshop and um, it's troubling to know that he has actually named adani a corporation which has also cast a shadow as far away as australia and as burma um we are very fortunate to have the next speaker miss emily pradichit founder and executive director of manusha foundation in thailand we're lucky because emily's just managed to reach bangkok after spending time in the provinces dealing with the case that she's going to talk about the uh, corporate capture um involved in the pichit gold mine case in thailand over to you emily thank you very much devi thank you very much for organizing this very important workshop we are sernet um sernet thank you so much so yes i just came back from pichit which is in the central which is in the central of thailand which is in a uh, in province where you have a lot of poor villagers uh farming and cultivating on the land so the story i'm going to talk to you about is the it's perfect uh, story of corporate capture with multiple manifestation of corporate capture so it all started in 2000 in 2000 when akara resource company uh, which is a subsidiary of kingstead an australian company uh, received a 20 years land concession from the thai government to start its mining operation in pichit provinces The issue was that at that time the company when they had the land conceded by the government did not inform uh, villagers and did not inform the population what were the potential adverse impact on water on their livelihood on their health and so the company also promoted the the mining operations as very do as, as very good way for villagers to to have a new way of living because many of the villagers living uh, working uh, studied working for the for the gold mining company however what happened was that in 2013 villagers who were working directly for the mining company started experiencing health impact so some of them start having very difficult uh, health uh, they were unable to to breathe properly uh, the vill many villagers were living only 300 meters away from the mining operations so those who were not working in the mining company they were also experiencing the impact because they were living nearby the mining company because the water started to be contaminated so they start having a lot of scratch on the on the body they has they start having uh, bad health and also they could not farm anymore because um the vegetables starting to be contaminated and the rice that they are cultivating started to be cultivated with contaminated water so what happened was that starting in 2006 in 2006 some villagers started to protest and one of the one of the villager who was working for the mining company was the person purchasing the chemicals so she decided to leave the company when she realized the very adverse impact that the mining operations had on the livelihood of the of the of her neighbors of her friends and the villagers and also because some of her friends started to die died out of health died because some of them had cancer but some of them also had mental health impact um so they did study to to start um mobilizing against the company and i think in then in 2008 the company started giving clean water to to the villagers because you know the thai government had an obligation to provide clean water under the thai constitution but the thai government was unable to do so so the company started to give clean water to the population but only to 100 villagers but when the villagers started to do they started to do their own documentation they realized that there were more than 6000 villagers that were impacted by the mining operations so 100 villagers receiving clean water was not sufficient and many villagers had to buy their own water uh, 400 baht per month which is a lot for which was a lot for them 
And a lot of villagers then started to protest and many of them were arrested when they started to protest under the Public Assembly Act. And some of them started to be sued because they were denouncing the, the mining operations uh, online on Facebook. And so they were facing defamation charges. And so when the, the more they were speaking out, the more they started denouncing corruption. And that's when the, the Anti-Corruption Commission of Thailand started to be involved in this case. Because then in 2008, 2012, between 2008, 2012 they, start, they started to investigate, since villagers became more vocal and started denouncing the corruption from state governments and how the company was paying um, some government officials, the Anti-Corruption Commission discovered that the license to, the license given to the gold mining company was actually bought through corruption. And it was not following a proper process. There were no environmental impact assessment that was uh, um, that was conducted at that time. And so government officials received money in order to approve the, um, the license. And in March, 2020, just last year, uh, the Anti-Corruption the anti -corruption Commission, it took them almost 20 years to come up with this decision that there was clear corruption. So what we have been doing to to support the villagers is that we have been supporting a class action lawsuit with more than 300 villagers, villagers pushing back on Akara and the gold mining uh, company. And that class action lawsuit has been accepted in, in October, 2019. Now the issue that we are facing is judicial interference. While the judiciary, while we are supposed to, to start the, the code hearing and legal proceeding on this case, each time the first code, the first code hearing has always been postponed. So before it was because of COVID, which we can understand. But now it's because of Akara gold mining, always asking judges to extend or to postpone the first court hearing, asking for more time to provide clear evidence. And what we have been witnessing is that judges were very, um, were very easily influenced by the gold mining company, saying yes very easily to the gold mining company, asking each time to postpone the the coup hearing. It was supposed to happen in October 2019, or it was supposed to happen in March 2020, then in October 2020, then on 15 February 2021, and now it been, is being postponed until 30 June 2021. What we also discovered was also the lawyer that had been um, appointed for this case from the Thai Bar Association are working pro bono. And each time we requested them to, to request official documents from specific hospital, to prove that there has been more than 1,000 villagers which, who have their blood contaminated by, contaminated by the contaminated water, the lawyers were not necessarily following our request. So evidence was missing. Also, the, the lawyers never, never went on the ground to collect the data. So it was us Manu, and Manusha Foundation each time going on the ground trying to support the villagers. And the lawyers were always agreeing with anything that the company was asking for. So we are obviously wondering whether our lawyers, our, whether the lawyers on this case are actually uh, impartial and whether they are not themselves being bought by the company, because we don't find it fair for the lawyers to actually stand by the company rather than standing by the villagers and rather than getting into, rather than instead of requesting clear evidence, the evidence that we're asking them to request from hospital. The issue is that hospitals do not want to give the evidence to villagers and hospitals don't want to clear the evidence to us as well. They are asking evidence to be requested officially by lawyers because some doc doctors have also been threatened by the company, uh, threatened that if they provide the information to the villagers, they might lose the job. Um, the judge that accepted the class action lawsuit in October, 2019 has been relocated. Uh, as a way of punishment for accepting the class action lawsuit. So this case for us is really problematic because it's a case of um, obviously corruption, corporate capture, communities have been manipulated. Um, and also the Anti-Corruption Commission of Thailand, although they are issuing reports that there has been commission, there has been corruption, nobody is being held into account because Thailand does not have a legislation, a strong legislation that would actually put perpetrators of corruption in jail. Uh, although the Thai government also violated the official information act by not providing proper information to villagers, nobody is being, um, is being uh, investigated. Um, 
risk. So what we are trying to do right now, because it's more than 20 years after that we are supporting the villagers at that time, we were, we were too young to know about the case. Um, we are obviously pushing back through the class action lawsuit. We are also planning on suing the Thai government for not providing um, proper water and adequate water to communities. And we are also submitting a complaint to the OECD national contact, contact point um, to push back on King State. Uh, which is the mother company of uh, Akara gold mining. Um, we're also trying to ensure that villagers are being protected because many of them have faced intimidation since the class action lawsuit. So we're also planning on submitting complaints to the, to the relevant UN special reporters. But I think that what is happening in Pichit, it's, uh, it's, unfortunately, uh, it's unfortunately very common in Thailand and also in Southeast Asia, how companies can buy a license for the mining operations. Although there is an ongoing case um, against Akara happening right now in Thailand, you should also note that the Thai government has also granted more land to Akara to, to undertake mining operations in other provinces of Thailand. So they totally overlook the fact that communities have already been impacted in Pichit and that there's an ongoing case against the company because they keep giving license to, to Akara to continue uh, the gold mining operations in Thailand. Thank you so much, Emily. That's a really intense example of every stage of the way in how there's been corporate capture, not just in the original substantive problem, but also in the whole um, pushback on communities trying to gain remedy for this problem. Um, and getting remedy is another um, point in this whole struggle for the uh, UN Treaty on Transnational Corporations um, um, and because gaining remedy is the main motivation for activists to push for this treaty. So we're very lucky to have with us Mar Marianne Manjabaya, a lawyer from the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International who has been very much engaged pretty much from day one on this UN Treaty on Transnational Corporations, the, 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 the drafting process which is in progress. Marianne um, Manja. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so welcome, I'm really glad you're here. Um, can you tell us about the threat of corporate capture in the UN Treaty drafting process and other UN processes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, Is it... No, it's dark. It's dark. And yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing your screen, but it's black. Oh no, how do I how do I has go your, about has this? your screen been captured by corporation? Yeah, I think so. And I'm using Mac, which is a, an Apple product that is an Apple which are is even a corporation that is even bigger but than most uh, third world countries you, so i don't can know can you try what... again just try again your screen share just and and select the um yeah it says your started screen share so you might have to click the software or the document you're trying to share so i did already and it's showing on my screen as well it's not showing on mine um bobby can you help out Oh, well, Manja, where do you need to select the screen, um, you know, the, the screen or tab where your PowerPoint is open? Or you can email it to us, I mean, if that's possible. Yeah, um, Manja, why don't you email it to Bobby right now? And then we will um, deal, uh, we just, and then I'll refer to something that Hassan, uh, Hassan Muhammad from the Maldives, um, asked the chatbot, which is, is corporate capture fundamentally different or more covert in its manifestations than corruption and industry interference in public policy? Um, uh, and Mona is uh, our resident expert on corporate capture is saying that corporate capture is essentially the same as corruption, but legalized. Um, you could say that in countries like the US, corruption is legalized through corporate lobbying and donations to public officials. Um, 
Bobby, have you been able to um, uh, download uh, Manja's uh, screen? I haven't got the email yet, so I'm waiting there. Manja, have you sent it across? Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. I hope you don't have any other friends named Bobby that it didn't, it went to the right Bobby. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we're going to wait, we're going to wait there. Um, but Manja, did you want to give a little bit of background on the treaty process while we're waiting for Bobby to share the screen? Hold on. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It, 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 it don't, you can stop the, sh stop the screen sharing so that Bobby can use it. And okay. just, just give us a verbal briefing to warm things up as we, to keep things rolling because um, we have a pack, we have an action packed program today. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Anyway, um, so briefly in, in my presentation, I will be going through uh, very briefly what's corporate capture and before going into corporate capture in relation to the binding instrument to the, uh, elaborate um, an international uh, treaty to regulate transnational corporations in relation to, to human rights um, and also see how what, what should be the demands of civil society and social movements in relation to the binding treaty. So as we as we all know, um, there has been there is an ongoing negotiation in the United Nations in relation to a binding instrument on business and human rights, and this is the sixth year that the United Nations that the working group on this uh, binding treaty has been meeting uh, to discuss the provisions and how to go about uh, coming up with a treaty, and at the moment we have a second draft. Of, um, of the treaty that is already going around for comments. And I think by the time um, they have their next session in October, there will be a new draft that will be released even before the session, which is uh, around July or June. So um, in my presentation, as I said, I, I'd be going through these three topics and um, next slide, Bobby. Uh, the video that we watched earlier is actually a clear uh, visualization of what is corporate capture. It has clearly illustrated in practical terms what cor corporate capture means. And for those who were not able to view the video earlier, I think Mona has posted the link on the chat box. So you can quickly go through it and also share it widely. Next. The elements of corporate capture were also discussed by Bobby. Um, next slide. And uh, Pan Sandeep and Emily were able to give concrete examples of what is corporate capture in relation to cases in India and in Thailand. What is very clear now is that corporate capture is felt by people on the ground in, this, in, uh, in their everyday life. And at this time, corporations have captured states, intergovernmental organizations, other international bodies and processes. So when we ask the question, who holds the power in international politics? Most people would probably say the usual largest states in the global system like Russia, USA, China, and so on. Yet multinationals like Microsoft, Walmart, Apple, Starbucks, they still wield phenomenal power because they oversee huge supply chains, sell products all over the world and help mold international politics to their favor or to their interest. And in some respects, multinationals have governments at their beck and call. So we witness their consistent success at dodging tax payments, for example. So in, when it comes to international politics, are states really calling the shots? Numerous corporations today are even more powerful than states. So if we see the next slide, we compare states and corporations based on how deep their pockets are. 
This table ranks the 100 largest corporations and countries on the basis of their revenue in 2016. It will show that states are still on top, the likes of USA, China, Japan, Germany, but 71 out of the 100 top revenue generators are corporations. All those in red are all corporations and those in black are text. Then the black text are states. So for instance, look at some of these American corporations that are bigger than states. On the next slide, um, we have McDonald's, which is bigger than, um, sorry, Latvia. And then we have Nike, which is bigger than Paraguay. On the next slides, there are more corporations, even bigger than so many other countries like Ford. We have Apple, we have ExxonMobil. Next slide. There's um, the Bank of America and ConocoPhillips. So these are just very few of the corporations that are even bigger than states. The sheer economic power of corporations highlights their influence today, not just within the national boundaries of states, but across states and even in intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations. Next slide. So over the past 50 years, corporations invested increasing resources into influencing public policies to protect their pursuit for profit and have gained increasing legitimacy in policy making spaces, including the United Nations. I would like to illustrate this by giving examples. For the next slide, corporate capture in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and Conference of Parties or the UNFCCC has been one of the, the there's the international uh, the international emissions trading association has been one of the entities leading the charge for carbon markets in the paris agreement and its guidelines aita was founded and run by some of the world's biggest polluters yet it is one of the most prominent and influential trade associations of the unfccc in the conference of parties on climate change in 2019 some of Spain's biggest polluters and others heavily invested and involved in fossil fuels had been bankrolling the COP25 meeting in Madrid, a clear conflict of interest since they are known for committing climate crimes. The United Nations and World Economic Forum partnership is about the transnational corporations having preferential and differential access to the UN system at the expense of states and public interest actors. This preferential access undermines the mandate of the UN as well as its independence. This partnership also means that the UN will be permanently associated with a transnational corporation, with transnational corporations. And it also means a wider latitude for corporate leaders to wield more influence in the UN. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization in 2020, civil society raised concern about UNFAO's plan to renew and strengthen its alliance with Crop Life International, a trade association for the pesticide and biotech industry. A strengthened partnership would deeply undermine the ability of UNFAO to make decisions on agriculture without the undue influence of Crop Life International. The United Nations Office of the High Commission in 2017 announced a five-year partnership with Microsoft Corporation and as part of the agreement Microsoft Corporation promised to prov provide a grant of five million dollars to support the work of the OHCHR. This kind of arrangement can undermine the independence of the High Commission on Human Rights at a time when the private sector is leading the charge against human rights and those who defend these rights. Other examples, next slide, include partnerships between next, the next one. It, it includes partnership between um, UNEP with ExxonMobil, Rio Tinto, Anglo American, and Shell, UNDP with Coca Cola on water resources, UN Habitat on Coca Cola and BASF on sustainable urbanization, and in the Global Compact of 2000. It promotes responsible corporate citizenship without obliging companies to adhere to international accepted standards. In the UN Financing for Development, 
in, it envisions an, on relying almost solely on private sector financing and public-private partnership in, relate, in relation to the sustainable goals. Um, yeah, so next slide. And so in relation to the treaty process on business and human rights, civil society have raised concerns about the influence of corporations and entities with strong connections to business interests in the treaty process. The International, Conven Conven International Chamber of Commerce, or the ICC, and the International Organization of Employers, or the IOE, have taken an increasingly vocal role in negotiations around human rights, climate change, and many more. In relation to the binding instrument, the ICC and IOE have been very vocal against the binding instrument and has made a strong presence in the treaty negotiations, trying to push for their positions. For instance, in the fourth session of the working group, working group on transnational corporations and human rights, these, organization, these business organizations issued an analysis of the zero draft of the treaty, expressing their lack of support for the text and opposing the inclusion of an optional protocol to the treaty. In the succeeding drafts, this optional protocol was totally dropped from the process. In the succeeding sessions as well, the ICC and IOE continued to influence the discussions while pushing to remove protective and accountability measures in the draft treaty. Next slide. So if we try to look at this organization, I instance, we can see that it represents some of the most abusive corporations in the world, including Dow, Chevron, and Shell, which have been implicated in hum serious human rights violations. This raises serious questions about the ICC and IOE's conflicts of interest when it comes to policy making to protect human rights, public health, and the environment. Corporate capture is a huge challenge for civil society in our lobby at the United Nations and member states for an international treaty on business and human rights, it is a very big stumbling block. If there is corporate capture of the United Nations, does this mean that it is impossible to achieve a treaty that can make corporations accountable for human rights abuses? Well, I think we say all is not lost for the next slide. We always highlight the example of the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, or the FCTC, which provides a powerful precedent for protecting policy making from business interference. The FCTC explicitly recognizes that tobacco industries irreconcilable conflict of interest with public health policy making. And measures have been put in place to protect the treaty process and implementation from corporate interference of tobacco companies. Next slide. So in relation to the Treaty on Business and Human Rights, we can and we must insist that policy making be protected from corporate capture so that the public interest, the voice of the 99% prevails. Next slide. So aside from preventing corporate capture of the treaty process, it is also important to put the people most affected by business activities at the heart of the treaty negotiations. This includes indigenous peoples, peasants, laborers, local communities, and women. The voices of the marginalized and vulnerable of social movements and civil society should have a preferential place at the negotiation table. In order for the treaty to be effective, states must ensure that this process is protected from corporate capture by the wealthiest 1% and economic elites. These demands will not be offered to us in a silver platter. And therefore it is important to strengthen our ranks from the national, local to the international level and let our collective voices be heard by states and the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much Manja and thanks uh, Bobby for making the PowerPoint possible, sharing the PowerPoint possible. So there we have connecting the pharma struggle, the manifestations, the pitch it gold mine case, and now um, corporate capture or attempts at corporate capture at UN level. 
and the FCTC, a model for containing and preventing corporate capture in public policy. That brings us to the next part of our workshop, which is about connecting the dots, corporate capture, religious fundamentalism, militarization, and the patriarchy. So um, in this uh, virtual room, we have with us some very passionate campaigners. I think everyone in the room is a passionate campaigner for human rights, but I wanted to um, ask some specific activists here, is corporate capture casting a shadow on your struggle? I'd like to start with Tista Setalvat, um, and a noted Indian civil rights activist who leads Citizens for Justice and Peace. She's a fierce campaigner against religious fundamentalism. Tista, are you here? I saw her enter the room, but now I don't see her. Have we lost Tista? Oh, Tista, hi. Hi, Tista, welcome. Hi. Can you see so, me? Yeah. Yes, we can see your gorgeous face. Thank you, thank you so um, much. So happy that you're here. Um, thank you so much. Tista, uh, yeah. where does patriarchy and corporate power figure in your fight against religious fundamentalism? You know, we've seen this dichotomy. We've seen this convergence of the two issues in India from the mid 1980s. I know I don't have much time and we've got a spectacular panel here. So I just want to flag a couple of issues that we've seen in the past one and a half years with this very traumatic COVID lockdown, the wealth of the wealthiest Indians, the top 15 grow by obscene amounts, 300%, while large sections of India have become impoverished. Coming to the question of religious uh, fundamentalism or what we call supremacism and uh, corporate capture and patriarchy, I think nothing can be a better example than the Gujarat model, which we had before the country over the last two and a half decades, the three biggest uh, crony capitalists have grown from the state of Gujarat, thanks to the proximity with the political powers that be. And the model that we saw in Gujarat of a kind of uh, programmatic violence and carnage in 2002, and the reading, uh, rendering of the Muslim minority into second class status, which continues today, is now being replicated in other parts of the country nationally, particularly in the state of Uttar Pradesh. And I want to just flag that a couple of policies that have allowed crony capitalism to grow and have allowed, like I said in this book that I edited some years ago, but I said that while we looked at the uh, violence dimension of the religious fundamentalism that was creeping into Gujarat, less attention was paid to the non-distributive high capital intensive pattern of jobless growth. Now those two crony capitalists are, who are today the big uh, players and are trying to push the policies and the three farmer laws that we've heard spoken about, for which we've had spectacular protests in the country over the last 110 days, are, have, been fest, have been groomed and allowed to grow in the state of Gujarat. And I think it's not insignificant that we see a kind of majoritarian uh, uh, electoral fascism growing there. India has been downgraded to kind of an electoral autocracy only recently. And it's extremely worrying in our struggle. The policy for demonetization. What did demonetization do in 2016? It actually, 97% of women workers are in the informal sector. And what demonetization did was kill the informal section, sector uh, of the Indian economy, which it, it, didn't, it didn't do much for black money because as the Reserve Bank of India told us, 99% of the money came back as I bite into the bank. So this whole bogey of black money remains. More capital has been concentrated in the hands of a few MSMEs, even middle scale industries have been destroyed. And the women in the workforce, which is patriarchy at its worst, has been worst affected. So whether it's unemployment, whether it's impoverishment, whether women as farmers, workers in the domestic sector, in the informal sector, in the industrial sector are the worst affected, even in terms of unemployment. India saw this dual path it took in the 1990s neoliberalism, opening up, selling off the public sector, and a sharp growth in majoritarianism, supremacism, stroke religious fundamentals. And the comments coming from central ministers about women, the kind of women 
that are appreciated by this dispensation are those that talk about motherhood, reinforce uh, uh, the stereotypes of reproductive rights, not women like Nodeep Kaur, Disha Ravi, Gauri Lankesh, or some, somebody like myself who, is, who are articulate, independent, and critiques, and are speaking consistently about deepening of democracy. So there is a close connection between corporate culture, uh, the, the, uh, the taking away of public resources and divesting them into private capital. We are seeing this happen in the Indian railways and with a lot of our public corporations and the growth of religious fundamentalism in India. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Dista. That was very concise in articulating <laughs> the fact that women are disproportionately affected and oppressed by this triumvirate of corporate capture, fundam religious fundamentalism, and patriarchy, but also that corporate capture is promoting, is, is, an, is an accomplice to promoting images of subservient women as being acceptable. Um, this is, um, so we wanted to go move to Arun I mean, I just, I want Yes, to, I yes want go, to, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, I mean, go ahead. I just want to flag two, three particular schemes of the central government at the moment which is like save the girl child, uh, you know, educate the girl child, Betty Bachao and Betty, Betty Parao. Just look at the increasing crimes against women across the country, but particularly in those states and provinces which are ruled by the right wing, by the extreme right wing, whether it's Uttar Pradesh, whether it is Gujarat. Look at the crimes against Dalit women, where the intersectionality comes, the caste, community and class all being a target. Look at a scheme like the Yud Ujwala Yojana, which was, you know, obscene amounts of public money have been used to promote government policies and to promote images of those in power. This Ujwala scheme is the gas, it's a free gas cylinder scheme which you saw at every airport, every railway station, every village had the photograph of this scheme with the prime minister. And what are you seeing with the increase in price rise, which is being governed by this corporate culture and the capture of corporate capital? You're seeing women who were given those gas cylinders going back to extremely harmful uh, cooking of food on fuel, on, uh, on wood fuel and other fuel, because it's unaffordable to have gas cylinders. So it, it is this sort of uh, propaganda on the one hand and complete inv invisibilization of women's work that we are seeing in front of our eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Tista. Thank you for those extra points. Um, uh, Arundhati Duru was supposed to join our workshop um, she's a feminist human rights defender who led one of the leaders of the anti dam people struggle of Namarda Bachao Andolan for several years and now a convener of the National Alliance of People's Movements. I understand Arundhati has headed to a remote area and is not um, reachable, so she's pre-recorded a video for our workshop. Bobby, can you please share it? I'm sitting in India right now, uh, where the concept of Bharat Mata and Hindu Rashtra, which is uh, hovering around all the citizens and especially women, uh, trans women, transgender community, queer community of this great country, uh, we are facing not only the issue of the increasing fundamentalism, and uh, but also the whole corporate power and also the more and more different trip the militarization, not only to our country, but in the whole South Asia region. Uh, we see that the fundamentalism, in fact, in the, in the, you know, in the context of cultural or religious based fundamentalism, power is invariably and most recently uh, easily exercised uh, by targeting women, uh, as they are the one who are not only on the last ladder, but they are the one who are regarded as the have a particular role uh, of the, as a reproducer of the uh, humanity, and that's why uh, there is a whole effort to target women through regulation of their uh, bodies, sexuality, fertility, uh, their roles their freedoms and rights are very, very clearly demarcated. And as we see more and more reduced to a specific, very narrow definition of what a good woman can be. And this actually, um, you know, so women's lives are the most uh, circumcised and restricted uh, by the fundamentalist patriarchal agendas. Um, uh, women are given the role of uh, representing the honor of the country 
and also custodians of community honor. And so they become particularly vulnerable to violence and repression when, uh, when they are perceived to be acting outside boundaries set up by the, the forces. So as we know that there is a whole concept of Bharat Mata, which is a peripheral, which is the, not in the peripheral, but in the centrality of the concept of Hindu Rashtra, of the Hindu nation. This goes beyond the, the own simple concept of nationhood, because this talks about a particular religion, which is the, not in only of the ruling party, but many of the cultural and socio-political organizations and ideology, which is a very, very regressive right big ideology they represent where woman is now her role is only regarded as her which is reduced to only to her uh, womb where she basically has the role to of producing sons which can not daughters mind you producing sons to protect this nation and that's why her womb has to be pure. So the whole concept of the Aryan bloodhood, whether it was run earlier in the whole, when we have seen in the Holocaust of Jews, or whether it is there now when there is a whole attack on the Muslims and other minority committees in India and other nations, we see that that her, basically her role is just only reduced to the womb, and she has to produce the sun, and that's why she has to be pure. The whole concept of purity, purity, and that's why then, then the whole concept of control so we can see that there is the whole control of the not only in the body what she should be wearing whom she should be talking what are the choices in terms of her sexual identity what are will be her choices in terms of her close intimate relationship including the marriage relationship and that's why this all the laws which are we have seen in a secular constitution we have where uh, you know the chief state which i sit in when the chief minister openly challenged the concept of the secularism women's role is more and more restricted so whenever she crosses these boundaries or when she asserts her mind, try to take a control of her body then or and her mind, then obviously she is completely facing the backlash. And that is now actually sanctioned also by the various laws which have been introduced in this country uh, by, uh, you know, uh, by this particularly Hindutva regime. So what we can see now that there are these concepts called love jihad, where uh, the, these are the laws which came where basically restrict women uh, if she marries outside her uh, caste and religion, that those marriages which are the uh, completely her choice as an adult woman to exercise her choice. Our constitution gives her that right to choose her partner, to choose her sexual identity. But our recent laws and legal changes, which are actually illegal, but brought in by the so-called electoral democratic, so we can, uh, government, act, then actually criminalizes the actions which are these choices. And then there is a backlash. The woman has been arrested. There is a whole effort of purifying her. So there is a whole concept of ghar mapsi that she can come back to the fold and she needs to be purified. There are these more and more restrictions, not only put up by the government, but by the society at large and the families which are now seeing the pressure with that allowing, not allowing girls, young girls to exercise these choices in all the relationship. This also matters only not only in terms so, you know, what are the interfaith uh, marriages or the intimate relationship? It also happens whenever, you know, I mean, the, the recently two days back, another chief minister of another right wing state rule go uh, government uh, state said that the girls who wear and the women who wear the ripped jeans uh, is not a sanskari, a cultured person. This is not our culture. This is not our Indian culture. So she is just reduced to what she wears, how she speaks about what, you know, whether she smokes, whether she drinks, it is accepted. It is regarded that the girl who wears um, uh, clothes, which are according to her choices, are not the saris or covering her whole body, uh, body is an impure girl. She is not a good girl. She is not a good daughter-in-law. And that's that's how all the choices, whether it's a terms of, and that's why there is a whole restriction also of the use of, let's take it to the further, even to the use of the mobile phone, because it is regarded that the girls exercising their choices, getting out of the house will be, uh, you know, she will get into the other relationship. She will start speaking her mind. She will need, need not be educated. So there are restrictions in terms of her education and in terms of her realizing her potential 
in terms of our movement so all mobilities are also extremely restricted so there is a, and then we see there is also at the same time because she is supposed to actually hold the honor because she is basically the womb of not only of a particular i mean her own womb so she completely loses her control over her bodily integrity because um, and then there is also at the same time we uh, see and that's why she needs to be protected from the outsiders that the whole concept and the one of the way to protect her from the outside is to restrict her mobility not allow her to um, get into the you know more and more into educational opportunity or get into the job market or getting into exercising her mind because that was the fear and that's why you, we can see also the rise in the early marriages uh, you know at the at this moment the law is said that there won't be a child marriage so it may not be because legally child marriages are less but there is a early marriage because she need to be protected and she need to be handed over to the another man who can protect her from the other um, you know elements and impure elements and that's the whole understanding of it at the same time there is also uh, you know controlling there is a increasing sexual violence against the ethnic minority group we are seeing that in our neighboring country uh, uh, myanmar where we are seeing the militarization is a, i mean the military coup which is happening there and we have seen also in the our uh, parts whether it's a kashmir or in the our northeast region where or chatisgarh in the conflict zone where brave it been used actually as a, a mode to control women sexuality and actually subvert so there is a increasing violence not only against the muslims but also against tribals ethnic minorities in kashmir in northeast in chatisgarh and we are seeing that it's a, uh, it's also used as a mode to control during the riots uh during the nationalist tendencies we have seen what has happened in the gujarat program where the womb of a pregnant woman was uh, kausar jahan was ripped open say and saying that we will kill her and there is also increasing rapes saying that we will actually impure and will ensure that only you will bear a hindu son so a hindu man still is planted in your body so her body becomes the whole carrier of honor and which are these are the practice and that increasingly also leads to the practice of honor killing and where the community literally comes out and say we did it because finally the community gives a is a false um, uh, you know set of identity which is a completely false narrative of building on the whole socio cultural identity and they are honoring the nation and that their responsibility to protect the nation and that obviously leads to the more um, you know there is a violation of lgbt right there are marriage so all we can see um, which is acting and this is whole part of the whole patriarchy so we see actually patriarchy in the midst of the fundamentalism and also this has happened because of the increasing globalization at the same time if we see after the covid 19 there are more and more women Uh, are completely almost 83 percent of women out of the labor force because not only because there is no economic chances but also the woman need to be controlled and she need to be you know out the she the first person to be thrown out so there is a complete uh, pauperization there is a complete marginalization and we can see that in the whole trade union and the recent labor laws which were so i'll just take it to the whole corporate how it is linked you know the whole corporate and globalization agenda is also linked to the whole concept of the you know the fundamentalism that actually when the recent labor courts which are introduced in india reduces the you know the working uh, the increases the working hours there is a more unequal pay uh, there are lesser and lesser uh, social security um, uh, uh, umbrella is that Actually restricted. We have seen in our recent budget where the whole, uh, you know, the budget for the women's uh, uh, empowerment was drastically reduced, and the funds which were created especially to handle the uh, sexual violence of women were had seen the hundred percent cut down in the fund allocation. So we see that there is an increasing corporatization and globalization also at the same time reduces her access and. uh you know the control over not only over the resources which she loses because of the displacement 
I come from the moment which is against the, uh, you know, to uh, work against the big dam. And we have seen how the displacement has not only led to the corporatization, but it has pushed many women uh, to become a migrant and got into the sex work. Uh, they were literally forced to uh, go into the sex work. And there is a more exploitation on the workplace. There is a lack of education, health. There is um, also the all the basic entitlement becomes more and more privatized. So whether it's a water, whether it's a food, whether it's a, these are the basic social security and basic entitlement guaranteed by any constitution. But as they become more privatized and, and because of the privatization and because of the corporatization, they become more and more expensive and out of the reach, especially of the ruler indigenous people migrant people and the women of all these communities you know these finally who do not have access and do not have any resources to actually then claim those private uh, those entitlement because they have now become privatized and they have become only a property of very lucky few and the thank you for that um, um so we've seen from um Arun, arundhati's very very rich um, analysis and sharing recording and also from Tista, an understanding of the intersectional impacts of corporate capture and corporate power as it serves as an accomplice in this process of growing conservatism and fundamentalism and patriarchy that controls and intrudes on every aspect of a woman's identity, of her place in the public sphere, even of her reproductive rights. I just wanted to wrap this up by asking Shoba to pull these strings together before we move on to the next session. Shoba, what, what should we be seeing moving forward? Uh, thank you, Devi. Now, Tista and Arundhati have summed up so well the current state of affairs in India which is present in many other countries too of the Asia Pacific region. And for me, religious fundamentalism and patriarchy go hand in hand and they abet corporate capture and allow the global 1% to play with the lives of the 99%. What we see happening around us has only deepened my belief that if we want a world which is socially just and ecologically sustainable, for you, me, and everyone, then the only possible future is a feminist future, a feminist fossil fuel free future. No one wants to live in a socially unjust and ecological unsustainable world. If I need to breathe clean air, eat clean, healthy food, and feel safe and live a life of dignity, then so does everyone else. And one lesson that this pandemic has hard taught us is the lesson with roots in the tra old trade union adage and mantra of touch one, touch all. And my strong belief again is that it is a feminist fossil fuel free future that can lead to sustainable development. Such a feminist future does not mean putting the current development model in the hands of women. It actually means having a different kind of democracy that is based on shared systems. Feminism is not about replacing patriarchy with matriarchy. Feminism is about solidarity. While patriarchy is synonymous with wielding power and violence against other people in order to gain more power, feminism is about using care and solidarity to change systems and to share and redistribute power. It is about sharing with others and caring for others. I do hope that many among you are feminists, irrespective of your biological sex. And the journey on the path of feminist future is a journey where we all unlearn and learn and relearn how to live a life of sharing, caring, and solidarity with each other. So please give the feminist future a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Shoba. So every friends, it's the five Fs, feminist, fossil fuel free future and understanding and emphasizing that feminism is not about replacing patriarchy with matriarchy, but feminism is the ultimate form of democracy and inclusion. 
Now we are heading into our final section, our final section of this workshop and um, allocating a little bit of time on discussing the experiences of participants in identifying and pushing back against corporate capture in their work. So we are very fortunate. I think we still have Prashant in the room. We have Prashant in the room. Prashant was leading a massive struggle against POSCO, a huge South Korean conglomerate. And Prashant, I was just wondering if you could share very briefly how the community and you were able to push back against this corporate capture. Please unmute and go ahead. Uh, you see, my moment is, uh, name is, uh, I'm spokesperson of the, uh, the anti jindal and the post moment uh, in the uh, eastern part of the India, that is Odisha, uh, and this is this Jagasimpur. And from the 2005, we are fighting against the multinational corporation against POSCO. And uh, after 12 years, POSCO has forcefully uh, the, uh, withdraw their project after the strong resistance in 2017. But unfortunate that uh, again, the government of Odisha and government of India again, or they invited to the uh, JSW, I mean the Sajan Jindal companies. And uh, they want to establish the power plant, cement plant, and captive port, and also steel plant. And uh, again, they are now preparing for the land acquisition because uh, 2,700 acre land was uh, land acquisition by the state in 2013. But uh, this land was now the government has handed over to the uh, Jindal. And now Jindal is preparing for another. 2,000 acre land for land acquisition forcefully. Unfortunate that, and uh, 2020, uh, December 20th, uh, the public hearing was happened uh, for the environment clearance. But now government of India has not decided till now the regarding the environment clearance because so many uh, complaint uh, was uh, uh, to given to the, including the our moment, uh, no other moment also they have given to ministry of the uh, ministry of the uh, government, government of india and so that still is held up now held up now this uh, clearance but uh, dear friends uh, my point is uh, you know that uh, why government is again again in same place after the withdrawal of the project many human rights violation many 400 above criminal cases still false and fabricated cases still pending and uh, still 700 people are under the police warrant why government is rigid and determined for the another they want to bring another place same place after the postco project this is my question our people question to everybody and uh, if, i mean the uh, asking to the government asking to the all uh, civil society why government is rigid why Government is always uh, corporatizing the uh, uh, the uh, interested and for land bank, and so we are fighting because we are saying that the land should be land should be returned to the uh, farmer because the 2013 the Land Acquisition Act said that if when within five years five years a particular company will not establish any project, then this land should be return to the farmer, landowner. But government is not listening. And another point, we are saying the implements on the Forest Right Act. Before that, the government of India has seen three committee, powerful committee, Saxena committee, Minagupta committee, Rai Pal committee. All committee has author authorized, recommended for the government of India, government of Odisha, for the implementation of the Forest Right Act by IFR and CFR. But we don't know why Till today, government is silenced and not implementing this uh, Forest Right Act. This is our uh, our main people have uh, main down demand. The please return our land and implement of the Forest Right Act 
and respect to police sabha resolution because police sabha is in very strong and the people's assembly I and mean, the village assembly is very strong so that you must uh, you must uh, respect to the the pros and the agency the public uh, institution uh, should be respected to all by all so my dear friends another point is again indian oil corporation want to uh, a pipeline the gas pipeline from the uh, paradip to hyderabad the pipeline they want to uh, enter the our propose our in village area so people are dead every day today also every day people are demonstration the proposed pipeline project area so so many uh, so many hurdles is going on in our area why government is not listening our people boys people are interested that people want to say, say want to say safely they want to uh, sleep and very safely they want to stay why this uh, people government is rigid and one, one after another project one after another project they want to establish in our area secondly due during this covid covid 19 the people are harassed because you know that sensitive area government is not looking matter that matter so the education and migrant labor situation is very worst in our area including entire india everywhere this situation happened maybe in the entire global also so dear friends my point is so everybody should uh, know and everybody should be think out this matter because how many days we will uh, will in the moment uh, and will continue the moment against the corporate against the government against the national government for the interest of for the safe to our livelihood the safe to our natural resources because jsw already got three mines area in our area so that they they are not upper hand so they want to very uh, happily they want to establish this uh, proposed cement plant proposed uh, steel plant everything so my friends this is our co situation people are every day they are uh, always asking to the civil society and uh, to the citizen to intellectual why government is uh, doing like that for the interest of the land bank interest of the uh, the uh, political funds why they are interested so it should be stop to the government agenda and government should be should be uh, respect to the people's village assembly resolution and be, government should be respect to the uh, the uh, forest right act implementation but government is not listening today till today government is always rigid that one by one about the project so my friends now the situation is host to host in our area people are again waiting for the forceful land acquisition after 2011 2013 again this year also we are waiting for this uh, this uh, land acquisition of course maybe fortunately the the uh, covid period is uh, continuing so that government may be not taking any drastic action against us we hope that but maybe in the tomorrow they will take they will take a severe action against us so i request to all that the student the corporation should be stopped and even should be control all the corporates in entire globe i mean the mining should be stopped because the you know, mining issue is host in our area because always the all companies coming interest of the mining and mining interest mining based companies mining based industries so that should be stopped by the even even strong even should be strong resolution against the corporate no, for the against the land creation of the land bank my friends so we all uh, blessing we are we hope to from we all for blessing for the success of our again moment uh, the moment of second moment against the jsw against the uh, iosl and we have success for the first moment of the against posco posco forcefully withdraw Uh, by our uh, strong resistance and your help and support solidarity i thank to all many thanks thank you so much prasant it is quite concerning that um the you know the international movement to support your struggle against the posco project it worked but then instead of returning the land and dropping all charges against 700 people years later the government is still maintaining that they're still refusing to return the land and in fact they've invited another 
company, Jindal, to take over that area. Um, Bobby and Prasant and all our friends, including Emily, um, please, please um, put in the chat box links to any open letters or petitions or information campaign sites that members in uh, this workshop and also other viewers can uh, can help out. So good luck, Prasant, and our solidarity is with you. Um, we have the next speaker is Prafula Samantara, and then uh, followed by Herman and Tete. I understand Prafula, who is the Goldman Environment Prize awardee and leader of Lok Shakti Abhiyan and the Niamgiri struggle, is caught up in another location, but he actually um, uh, made a short recording. Um, Bobby, is that available? First, I would like to thank all our friends and participants on this virtual uh, seminar. And uh, it is also the, in the whole the world, it is a challenge for us. The global capitalism is invading our every matters of the life from kitchen to the anything else to the forest and river and sea. Today, we have been experiencing that even a crisis, that a global crisis we are facing as a climate change and as well as also though it temporarily, but it is the coronavirus, that is the COVID-19. But the national governments throughout the world, they do not realize to do the environmental justice or economic justice or any justice to as a human being. Everything is violated by the elected government as well as also the naturally the dictatorial regimes in the world. And this is, this is a challenge for us because the name of recovery, of economy, the countries like India, though it's a vast democratic country, we have parliament, we have legislative assembly, we have judiciary, independent judiciary. But today, the entire the corporate captured every institution the parliament, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, and the policy-making systems of our country. And it happens everywhere in the world. The capitalist country like uh, or this uh, <coughs> USA or uh, anywhere. So this is a challenge for us. How to challenge? How to make? This is the way only Mahatma Gandhi our father of nation. And as the world leader for peace and non-violence, he had taught us that we can challenge the imperialism or neoliberal economy through the non-violent people struggles, mass movement. And this is a challenge before us everywhere. I think we are now, I can say, in India, where I am working in Odisha also, we have got this result through mass movement, non-violent movement, that Niyamagiri has been saved from unscrupulous mining of bauxite by Vedanta Company. The people struggle, as well as the legal struggle in the Supreme Court that gave the verdict that peoples are the owners of the natural resources. And it is a fact that even in our constitution, the indigenous people's community are the owner of resources. But the state is a corporate state, police state. The state is doing injustice through unconstitutional rules, regulations, policies to destroy the natural resources, whether it is forests, rivers, 
are caused in name of the profit. And this capitalistic development destroys the lives of the millions of people who depends upon the natural resources as gift of nature. And in Yamigiri, this non-violent mass struggle by the indigenous people like Dangria communities, we could achieve. And because of this movement, and as well as also our constitutional provisions, the Supreme Court had to accept the supreme right of the common people over the natural resources. And today, in India, it is a glorious day for our movement. Though it is a challenge for us, the democracy is going to be perilled. Democracy is going to be threatened. Democracy is going to be reduced to a just dictatorship. Though there is an elected government in India, but the farmers, the laborers, the landless people, they have come together throughout the country under the banner of Sanjukta Kishan Murcha, the United Farmers Forum in India, who have challenged the Indian government's dictatorial regime and three black class which will destroy our agriculture, economy, as well as also the food security. So uh, today is 113 day. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's extremely uh, compelling to hear from both Prashant and Praful, but I'm also looking forward to a personal hero speaking, and that's Herman Kumara from NAFSA, the National Fishery Solidarity Movement of Sri Lanka. And the reason Herman is one of my heroes is that he is a hardcore campaigner with amazing analysis and so concise. Is that a heavy hint, Herman? Over to you. Thank you, Devi. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, um, representing part of the 99% uh, with the small scale fisher people in the world and specifically in Sri Lanka. Uh, we are facing one of the biggest uh, construction project in Sri Lanka, uh, devastate uh, small scale fisher communities uh, in uh, Sri Lanka through the, through the funds of uh, Chinese the China Harbor Engineering Corporation and China Communication Construction Company. They are investing to uh, reclaim a land of uh, 400 hectares. Uh, it's about 1.4 billion US dollars. So it is part of this non well-known uh, Belt and Road Initiative because we are one of the important leg of uh, the BRI. So uh, they are trying to build up a new autonomous uh, metropolis area with office complexes, condominiums, hotels, and many uh, investing sites in, 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 in uh, this uh, port city, we call it port city in Sri Lanka. So to do this, they pour more than 85 million uh, sand, cubic meter sand, to, to the sea and which caused serious damage to the coastal communities, coastal areas, uh, man, uh, uh, coral reefs, seaweeds, and totally destroy the economy of the coastal communities uh, in, 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 in uh, western coast of Sri Lanka. It's around 30,000 families, uh, depending on those resources. Uh, because of sand mining, this is really, uh, really damaging to the environment. And also, this is not only environmental damage, but also this is politically damaged because it's kind of a uh, issue of sovereignty in the Sri Lanka. But you know, the people, they realize the uh, danger, they realize the difficulty that they are going to face, mainly the small scale fishers. Then 
as the saviors of the uh, fisher people, they are mostly Catholics and the Catholic Church came forward. Firstly, they were with the church, uh, the church was with the uh, fisher people. Then what happened? The church was really uh, set, a, set a slogan that, okay, sand mining is the only issue. But the people's movement against the port city, they had uh, they had more deeper and more uh, 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 deep analysis on the situation and they realized how it's going to happen to the economy, to the sovereignty and environment and social fabric of the people. So they had their own ways of uh, resisting of this uh, struggle. But what happened? The church and some of the leaders of the struggle, not the PMEPC that was the uh, movement, but the church funded, church supported groups, they were really uh, go with the uh, that slogan and they stopped the resistance against the port city uh, challenge. What happened uh, later, we realized that around 30 million Sri Lankan rupees were given to the church to keep church silence. And they said fake targets and the whole process was stopped. However, the people were moved forward. Then what we realized when Fisher people, they came forward, 500 million rupees were given to uh, fisheries department to uh, give loans for the fisheries cooperatives, Fisher people who are fighting against this struggle. So what happened? There were, I mean, serious division among the, among the, among the Fisher groups so that the struggle was further weakened. And then, even though those uh, situations, the people were, uh, the struggle was carried forward, but when we come forward, when the people were come forward, but media was not reported these things, why? Media personnel, those who are really close to us, they said, our media stations have informed us not to report these protests because they are not supporting all these things. So what we realized, the media, the church, the people, they all were bribed by the company. At the same time, when we go to the Supreme Court demanding the uh, agreement between the, the corporation and the, and the uh, Sri Lankan government, we realized that they are not really ready to give this information to us. Why? Supreme Court says, this is uh, some sensitive information. This is uh, really a challenge to the national security. Then we cannot uh, give this information to you. So that's the situation what we face. So it's very clear. Though the people are really in danger, the law, the media, the church, and of course, people themselves are really go behind money. and. That was happened in this struggle, but the struggle continues. What is this uh, important thing is all these have a, a real uh, interest of money and corporates, they bought them. So that's what happened. However, the people movement, people's movement against port city is moving forward. So we take this issue forward and we are continuing to fight against this because we know this is not only environmental damage. This is only not only social damage. This is not only economic damage, but also we are victims of Chinese, Indian geopolitics. I mean, this geopolitics, uh, we are the victims. So we are going to face this situation uh, uh, in coming years. So in that situation, the struggle is continuing. We are continuing educating people, getting them forward and fighting against this situation because otherwise uh, we feel uh, the, uh, the this uh, land will be further widened and they will be having their own own land I mean chinese they will have their own land in this in this island and they will continue as they want and it is just doorstep of india and we are in real danger of this situation so 
that's what I want to say, share at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman, for sharing that. It's also reminding us of how uh, the Buddhist monks in Mandalay and other parts of uh, Burma, Myanmar were, were given generous donations by Chinese companies in order to stop being, um, uh, stop the local, well, stop supporting local resistance against land grabs linked to the BRI projects. Now we've heard now from Herman on the port city and sign mining project from Prashant and Perfula on how corporate capture has been both push and pull factors in attacks on, uh, on livelihood, food security, sovereignty, environment, land rights of indigenous peoples, of fisher folk, of the urban and rural poor. And now I'm, I'm pleased to um, invite Tete Nera, Nera Laron from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung to talk on climate justice and corporate capture. Climate just, climate being, uh, since climate change is such a significant threat globally. Over to you, Tete. Thank you very much, Debbie. And good afternoon to all our friends and colleagues and comrades. First off, solidarity, we stand with Myanmar, Debbie. Um, it's a tough act to follow, no? Because we, we heard real stories from the ground and we know that this is the, real, this is the lived reality that many of our communities face, no? And um, I just can't help but really think about the huge disconnect between what is the situation that we face on the ground versus you know how things are nice and rosy at global at the un level now um i can't help but think about that fundamental disconnect that we're 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 facing right now and it brings me to the speech of the un secretary general last december where he talked about the state of the planet and i feel it was almost flawless no, he was able to give us impeccable facts and figures about the state of the climate crisis. He also said that human activities are at the core of the breakdown of the Earth's natural systems and that the time to avert the irreversible impacts of climate change, you know, it's fast running out. As we speak, um, the climate clock is ticking fast. We are now down to six years and 289 days before the irreversible impacts of climate change. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, you know, governments and the multilateral system in general, although there's an absence of formal face-to-face -face negotiations, there's been a lot of high-level meetings already trying to drum up international cooperation and international solidarity towards a clean and green climate positive recovery both from the pandemic and you know the multi-layered crisis that has been exacerbated by COVID-19. So everyone now talks about the need for ambitious climate action as if inaction was our biggest stumbling block and as if increased climate action from everyone will indeed solve the global problem. No, um, I'm being sarcastic and I'm trying to highlight as if, because this kind of construct shoves under the rug the structural and systemic roots of the climate crisis. No, as if, uh, climate action and climate ambition alone would save us from decades and the continuing legacy of colonial plunder. Now, without addressing this from a climate justice lens, all of these talks around climate action will be a very dangerous distraction. Now, climate action now is being used as a smokescreen for more climate disruptive and carbon intensive programs that reproduce the same inequalities that were existing and exacerbated by the pandemic. I'll give you two quick examples here. No? Countries are now riding the bandwagon of net zero emissions through nature-based solutions. 
Net zero means the atmosphere is spared from new emissions by restoring the forest or using technologies that capture carbon to balance out. This kind of approach allows rich countries and corporations to buy and dazzle their way out of the problem using techno fixes instead of transforming production and distribution to achieve real zero. So us in civil society, us in social movements, we need to really unpack what is the difference between you know, the mantra now, which is net zero, and what is needed is real zero emissions. The next part would be nature-based solutions. And I'm sure a lot of our speakers have already alluded to that without calling it by its technical term. Nature-based solutions through public and private partnerships are those restoration and conservation projects no, that um, maintains profitability for corporations, maintains and ensures the supply of raw materials that corporations need while maintaining a clean, profile, clean and green profile for them. So I'll keep it short and sweet. I said the UN Secretary General's speech was almost perfect. It was almost perfect except that it's fundamentally flawed. And I think this session now clearly exposes, you know, the huge disconnect between what governments say at the global level and what they actually do you know, uh, back in our own countries. And it is up to us, the 99%, to expose, oppose, and build a better future for everyone. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Tete. That was uh, uh, intense and concise and short, but not that sweet. Um, uh, now we, we are already starting to see real zero versus net zero. Uh, the, the the corporate capture of climate the climate justice agenda and uh, basically a greenwashing process which we need to resist against and now we've come to I'm, I'm just amazed that we had such a lot of amazing speakers and presentations and everybody was incredibly disciplined about keeping time and I just wanted to note that Herman actually had a PowerPoint, but ditched it because he decided to be as short as possible, mindful of the time. And this is where I'm going to lobby publicly, Bobby Ramakant. Bobby, I think we need another session so we can use Herman's PowerPoint. And the session should be on corporate capture and the Belt and Road Initiative. So please, please think seriously about that. And then we can use Herman's yes, PowerPoint. Um, and now we're coming to the final, final last nine minutes. And in that nine minutes, I wanted to first invite Mona to, um, to address what can we do? We now see the problem. It has a name. We've seen manifestations, not just theoretically, but real life manifestations that I felt deeply on the ground. Mona, what's next? Thanks a lot, Debbie. Um, that is a very important question. And perhaps I, I want to respond to a question that had a similar, um, um, you know, a similar thought in, in the chat box by Alex, who um, was saying, do civil society organizations and different grassroots groups have enough opportunities to talk to each other and exchange strategies for resisting corporate capture? And I think in response to what is next is that we need to continue having these spaces, spaces like today where we are talking about corporate capture and sharing examples of capture and how democracy is being undermined and how we can take back our spaces, you know, spaces that we worked really hard to build. Um, and we need to work on policy and legislative reform to push back against legalized corruption, basically. Um, and we need to similarly ensure accountability and transparency in all our government decision-making processes. Um, and I think the best way that we can do that is if we continue to organize together, continue to have these spaces for exchanges, 
but also spaces for exchanging the different strategies that we can use to push back against corporate capture. Um, like it, taking the, the UN treaty process as an example, um, in how we can defend the UN treaty process against corporate capture um, and make sure that it centers our affected communities um, at the heart of the process and the protections that it should be giving them um, is basically, um, I might share this actually, um, in our background document that we did on the, on the comic, I don't know if you can see it all. Um, I hope you can see it, yes. but yes, in yes, any case, yes. perfect, great. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in this background document, if you go scroll down to the bottom and it, it's very easy to get there, um, I can show you how to get there as well and, and how to read the comic, but um, one, one very concrete action that you can take is um, to send a letter to your state pushing back against corporate capture in the UN treaty process. The letter is here, you just click on it um, in this document and then you get essentially a template letter that talks about corporate capture within the UN treaty uh, process and you know how we want to push back against it and we want to protect the process from, from um, capture. So that is a very concrete thing that people can do. Another thing that can be uh, done, uh, can you see still my screen? I hope so. Yes, we can. We can. Oh, perfect, okay. So um, another thing that can be done, I think if, if you go to um, the ESCRNet uh, webpage and then you go to the Corporate Accountability Working Group, You'll see here we have the comic series about the power of the 99% to stop corporate capture. We have um, other episodes coming up um, on, on capture of our healthcare system, but essentially if, if, if we can uh, collectively use some of these uh, tools, like essentially they are made for um, our members and by our members who have a lot of experience and who uh, many spoke today, uh, but, you know, if we can share um, some aspects of, uh, of, of, of corporate capture that we're seeing, not only at the regional level, but capture of the UN and capture of really important institutions that are meant to protect us, if we can use these in political education um, and, 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 uh, and, and try to have a collective name for our problem, then I think we can also come up with many different other strategies to overcome this together. Um, and I will stop here because I know that there are others that can speak to this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mona. And um, thank you for responding to the questions in the chat box. And um, Herman just came back to the room and I'm just telling Herman that we are going to be using your PowerPoint at the next session, uh, which Bobby is putting together on corporate capture and the Belt and Road Initiative. Now I'm coming to the end of my duty as facilitator for the session. I just wanted to acknowledge that we had participants from South Asia, including India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, if I'm not mistaken, and also the Maldives. We also had participants from Burma, Myanmar, um, looking at Tintue there, um, um, Indonesia, um, and Thailand. And, um, and, and of course, we had one Palestinian based in Ireland, M Mona, joining us, and, um, and the Philippines, uh, Teted and, and Manja. But um, I don't know where Lorraine is from. She looks, Lorraine looks very French. But um, we have a very amazing uh, group of speakers, and we had a very amazing group of participants. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Shoba, our host. Uh, thank you, Debbie. And uh, on behalf of ASEAN Burma, ESCR Net, and CNS, I thank all the speakers and listeners and the moderator for enriching the workshop which we had today with their participation and presence. Special thanks to Dr. Siva Prasad Reddy for streaming the workshop live on the TSPR TV channel of Telangana, India. 
I also invite each one of you cordially to our next workshop, to join us in our next workshop on Sunday, 21st of March at the same time, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Bangkok time on no excuse for inaction on health security if we are to deliver on development justice in Asia Pacific. Bye till then and have a good day. And we are actually dot to the time. So thanks everyone for that as well. Thank you. And namaskar. Thank you everyone. Thanks Thank everybody. you everybody. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you.